Welcome back to Olson Speed Shop. In this episode, I'm going to tell you why I felt like Alexander yesterday and had a terrible, horrible, awful, very bad day. So, we're working on this 55 Chevy, trying to get it to run now. Uh, we've got it in the garage, as you can see. Um, when I think we last left, we just cleaned out the trunk. The only thing I knew about this engine was that it turned over by hand a little bit. I just barely did it a little bit. So, here's where we're at. Saturday, yesterday, I got up, pulled all the plugs out of it. This was actually a couple days before, but it doesn't matter. I pulled all the plugs out of it, filled up the cylinders with some Marvel Mystery Oil. Then I started to decide whether to pull the starter out or to try to fix it. Well, the starter was spinning. It just wasn't engaging. So it was a solenoid problem. So my dad's like, just check the wiring, of course. So I just checked the wiring. Um, found a bad wire on the solenoid, mouse eaten, which is a common problem I'm finding on this car. But fixed that. So here's the beginning of the terrible, awful, very bad day. Got the starter going. That's a good thing. Hit it. It turned it over. Excellent. All that mystery oil went out onto the wheel wells. Dang it. I wanted to let that sit for a while. Anyway, filled them back up. Uh, that was the beginning. So then I got looking more into it. Found that I wasn't getting any spark. So, got looking again. Found another eaten wire at the ballast resistor. Fixed that wire. There I got 12 volts at the ballast resistor, both sides of it. 12 volts to the coil. Nothing to the points. No big deal. Had to change points anyway. So, I changed points, condenser, rotor, cap. And I had spark plug wires. I bought the spark plug wires to go under the manifolds. You, know, you can go above the manifolds or under the manifolds. Uh, from the factory, they came under the manifolds. It's a lot cleaner. Uh, it keeps them from burning. I think a lot of people use the ones that go over the manifolds just because they're cheaper and they're a lot quicker to install. So anyway, I bought the ones to go under the manifold. I'd planned on crawling under and running them all right and getting them good. Uh, then I got impatient and really wanted to see this thing run. So I took my under the manifold wires, ran them over the manifold. Um, just, I will eventually run them under the manifold. But I just, I kind of want to hear this thing cough. I want to make sure it runs. And uh, I'm not a very patient man. But, so, anyway, that's where we're at there. After that, I've got spark. I've got spark at the spark plugs. That's half the battle, so we're good there. We have spark. I wanted to change on the oil before we get cranking it. Uh, so I dumped the oil, and then I went to change the oil filter. Now, in 1955, these cars originally came without an oil filter. Chevy, I've, I've said this before, Chevy thought that their engines run so clean they didn't even need an oil filter. They quickly found out they did need an oil filter. And so there's two options. And we're talking early 55. Um, you can go to the dealer and have them install one, or the dealer just installed them when they got them. One of two things. If you bought one without, you could take it back to the dealer and get it installed. Um, done a little bit of research on it. Now, you guys can comment and correct me if I'm wrong, which I very well may be wrong. But what I've came to the conclusion of, or what I've researched and found, is on your oil filter housing, on the 55s, in... Side note, in 1956, they put that housing on the block itself, and uh, it's not up by the carb on, as the 55s are. 
but I've heard that later 55 Chevy decided they needed that filter so from the factory they put them on if they came from the factory they were all black if you have a filter housing and it's blue that's a dealer option a dealer had put that on either after or right when they got the car they put that on before they sold it so blue is dealer option black is factory only 55 um, 56s came like I said with it on the block kind of like the normal uh, small block Chevys except that it wasn't a spin on it was a cartridge type filter so anyway let me continue on why I had a bad day as I was messing with spark getting things working uh, starter was working spark was working oil was changed I needed to take off my oil filter housing completely um, as you pull these filters out they don't self drain themselves back into the motor so when you're changing your oil and you change that filter you need to get that fill that oil out of that filter housing if you don't, you're going to have over a quart of oil that's old oil that's not going to get changed. So, I did what I thought was a good idea and just tried to figure out a way to suck that out. And I knew my wife had a little turkey baster. We just talked about it. So I ran in the kitchen and got the turkey baster, sucked that out. Well, when I got to the bottom of it, I realized there was a lot of sludge in that thing. Now, I looked down the thermostat housing. Uh, I knew I was going to change the thermostat, but there was a bunch of junk in that thermostat, on top of that thermostat. If you remember from the first video when I looked through this, the actual radiator hose was eaten up by mice. Um, maybe we ought to call this car Jerry. Or was Tom the mouse? No, Tom was the cat. We'll call it Jerry. Anyway, that hose was eaten up, and there was a lot of debris in there. I knew it had to come off. Kind of a dumb design, I think. So if, if I can get the camera lady to come in here. So here's the housing I'm talking about. Blue. There's a little, you can just see a little bit of blue paint on here. Uh, on this other side, there's more blue paint. So this is from the dealer. Okay. Right here is your your water, your thermostat housing. Kind of a dumb design. So if you want to change the thermostat, you got to pull off the, th the housing, and then this is on top. This is in between the thermostat housing and the intake manifold. So you need two gaskets if you're going to do this. You pull this off, you can pull this off. Now I pulled this off completely, like I said, because the oil change. It's just two lines, one there and one at the very bottom. The way this works is there's a tube down the center of it, which this line goes to. It goes back to the block. And that, you would think that there would be a hole in the bottom of that, but there's not. If there was a hole in the bottom of that, it would drain back. It's not. The way this works is oil comes in through the bottom, up that tube, gets to a point goes out the filter to the outer edge and then back to your engine now that could be vice versa it could come up through here through the filter and in I, I think it's the other way around though anyway crappy design to, to make this bracket part of this I think it just adds another area of leaking so you need two gaskets like I said Anyway, I've changed the thermostat. It's good to go. So, the next uh, the next part was to get some fuel going. Got me this boat tank here. I thought this is going to be slick and easy. Got fuel line that I was going to run directly to the carburetor. I got me a clicky clacky fuel pump. I'm like, well, oh, there's nothing that could be that much easier than that. You can see I had this hooked up. It's grounded there. And then I had this wire run into the battery. 12 volts. It was clicking and clacking. Good to go. 
Went back to the carb. Never got the never could get fuel to the carb from it. Clicky clacky is just not working. Uh, I pulled this off. I actually clicky clacked. I actually got it working, and it never took never brought fuel out of there. Uh, something. It's moving, but it ain't moving fuel. So that's the other bad part. Um, at that point, I was leaning over, messing with this, getting a little bit frustrated. Like I said, I'm I'm impatient. I wanted to at least hear this thing cough. Had my cell phone in my pocket here, and uh, it fell out. I heard it hit the engine. It did the Plinko game through the engine. Da -dum, da -dum, da -dum, da -dum, my phone. This is my phone. And what does it drop in? Drops in the bucket of antifreeze that I had at the bottom when I pulled the hoses. So, if anything, me and my, me and my kids fight. I'm an iPhone guy. They're Android guys. Let me tell you, that iPhone, which I'm videoing this video on right now, is the very phone that was in that antifreeze yesterday. <laughs> so, so maybe that's a, a test for iPhones. This isn't the latest, greatest waterproof iPhone. This is a classic SE. It's, it's not a, it's not a new phone. Anyway, I. Got it, put, wiped it off with some shop towels. I blew some compressed air in it. And uh, my wife had told me, you put a phone in rice, it'll dry them out. I went in, said, we got some rice. We threw it in some rice. Anyway, she fixed it. She got it working. Uh, anyway, long story short, uh, speaker wasn't working. She cleaned out the headphone port, which there was a bunch of black gunk in. And uh, lo and behold, it works. So, there you go. iPhone. That's one for iPhone. I told my kids, let's try that with your Android, but none of them will take me up on it. So, let's not wear our iPhone in our pocket anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I love having front pockets because I always put my glasses and my iPhone in there, but I, they've dropped a lot too. Yes. How about we don't keep antifreeze buckets under the cars? Yeah, that you can control. <laughs> so, Anyway, so the plan right now is I got a new mechanical fuel pump for this. I'm just going to I'm going to change that out. I'm going to run the boat tank to the in, inlet side of that mechanical fuel pump. Run that up to the carburetor. Now, yes, you can fill it with gas. I have gas in here. I baby fed it. Um, I've got it to cough a couple times. Um, I'm hoping that my bad day doesn't go worse. I know I have some low compression on this engine. My hope is, I just, I at least want to hear it run. I want to make sure that the trance works. I think it should be able to fire and, and at least drive somewhat. It does have low compression, but. I'm positive that all eight cylinders aren't low compression. So, uh, like I said, it never did run yesterday. I got it to pop. I'm, I'm gonna have to start messing with the timing at this point. I was thinking that the timing would be all right um, because I hadn't touched the distributor at all. But at this point, we're gonna have to start looking into that. So, that's where we're at on the 55. I actually, I'm not, I'm not going to call this Jerry, I actually named it, it's going to be called Nadine. Um, there's a reason for that, maybe I'll get into that on another video. But I also want to talk about a, another 265 engine that I picked up. Um, after we got this 55 I started looking into these 265s and they're not a real popular engine They're kind of like the 307 the, the modern 307 or the, the 307s back in the day kind of hated upon 
Um, people say you can't get a lot of horsepower out of them. They're low compression. The their front mount engines, their starter isn't built in the block. The bolts to hold the starter are in the block, um, like the. 57 and on V8s were. But that kind of had me thinking that there are so many people hating on them that I might want to do something with it. I've got the Frankenstein car that I'm going to build. I'm getting pieces for it. I've got a 27 Essex. I've got a 32 Ford frame. I've got a Ford rear end. And I'm a Chevy man. I got looking into that and I'm like, I don't have one Chevy part on this car that I'm building, this hot rod. And uh, so I decided 265 would be a great engine for that. So I got searching the, the internet, found a 265 that was in my price range, that was, was a really good deal. And uh, let me show you that. Where is it? It's in the S10. Oh. The mini S10 is actually pulling its weight in the shop truck. So, this, you see we're a little sagging here, but we got a 265 out of a 56 Chevy. It's known, it run and drove into the, into the garage. Uh, so it runs and drives and the guy pulled it because he had a 350 crate engine that he was putting in a 56 uh, Chevy wagon. Um, it's going to be a cool project. I can see why people don't want to go through the hassle of these 265s. But, this is what I'm going to do with it. The whole point of my build, my hot rod build, is that I want it to be like a 50s era hot rod. Like, uh, like a, a guy would build in the 50s out of parts you know I found a wrecked 56 Chevy that had a V8 yanked that six cylinder out of the Essex put in the V8 and uh, anyway so I'm gonna get this engine I'll clean it up I'm gonna put the Duntov cam in it in fact I'm looking for a Duntov now 55 and 56 had a special cam they were the 077 cams. Um, 57 and later went with an 097 cam, uh, Duntov. So if you know where a NOS 077 cam is, now I can use an 097 also, but I'll just have to put an oil relief in the back of the cam so it has oil pressure. But that's not, that's not a bad thing to do. It's actually fairly easy. So 077, 097, the exact same spec cam other than the oil relief in the back and I'll take either one if you know where one is shoot me a comment uh, and uh, I read all the comments that I get so I'm going to put that in it's a solid lifter cam straight out of the 50s you could you could buy a 56 Chevy and you wanted to hop it up especially one like this this is the two barrel Rochester you went down to your dealer, you bought the Duntov 077 cam, solid lifter cam, slapped it in, uh, of course change out your carburetor, and uh, I guarantee you when you're at a car show, if I pull up in my Essex with that solid lifter cam, the old school guys, that sounds pretty good too, the old, old school guys will turn their heads and look at it and it'll bring back memories kind of funny because I, I wasn't even born when that was around but that's the stuff I dig and uh, that's what I'm building that hot rod for and uh, hoping to to uh, get it built in a couple years and and be out at speed week with it not racing it just cruising it so that's where we're at on the on the 55 wasn't a very good day didn't get it running dropped my phone in antifreeze I bled a little, probably cussed a little, and uh, and then I got I got a a bad foot, and it sure acted up yesterday too. So it wasn't a very good day, but it will get better. 
So, stay tuned. We'll see if this thing can run. Worst case scenario, if there's not enough compression for that thing to run, I'll take all the parts that I put on it. I'll put it on this, whether we plop that into the 55 or whether that goes into the hot rod, it's still money well spent. And uh, all in all, it's not that much money for points and cap and fuel pump. And it's actually pretty cheap. So anyway, hopefully next week at this time, We'll have a running Chevy. Hopefully it's driving. Running, driving, it won't be breaking as far as uh, stopping. But we got reverse, and we got forward, and we got an ignition switch. So that's good enough. We'll take it for a spin around the neighborhood. Keep your fingers crossed. No more bad days. And we'll talk to you guys later.